But when it comes to being filled and being empowered, being set free, being commissioned, receiving a grace of His, or being or receiving empowerment from Him, or asking for more from Him, I don't like to put Him on a timeline. I'm going to do it till He answers, because that's what He told me to do. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, and um, and and I and I I love the Holy Spirit, and I love talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, I I uh, I think it's natural that um, we uh, sometimes don't understand the Holy Spirit as the context of what He means to us, and. And, and I say that in the sense that growing up in, in a church context, I, we, as a church, we have good our, uh, language for God the Father and who He is. We have good language for the story of Jesus Christ and who He is, the Son of God. But oftentimes when it gets, comes to the Holy Spirit, it's so wrapped in mystery that we naturally try to shy away and most people don't know how to articulate uh, uh, the person of the Holy Spirit, and so we end up not really focusing on uh, on that aspect of the Holy Spirit, and in doing so, we ignore someone so important to our Christian walk. And uh, and so I I, I just want to focus a little bit on the Holy Spirit. Some things I might say to you might be rudimentary, but and uh, I, I still think that it's good to talk about it because I don't know. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't realize what we don't know until I, we say it. And so uh, I said a, a little bit about this um, yesterday. But but listen, the Holy Spirit is God. We have to remember that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one. It is an orthodoxical Christian creed. Uh, if I said, if I said, uh, uh, if, if some, if 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 a pastor came up to me and said, "Paul, you can talk about God, the Father. You can talk about uh, Jesus Christ, but but uh, st- stay away from this Holy Spirit stuff," I would say that's heresy. If, in the same manner, if a pastor came up to me and said, hey, Paul, you can talk about uh, 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 God the Father and, and, and the Holy Spirit, but stay away from this Jesus stuff, that would be heresy because Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And so I know we know that, but sometimes when we hear that, we articulate it, we're like, are we sure? Uh, there's a great book that I read growing up, uh, not growing up, uh, uh, growing up in the ministry um, when I was a student uh, by R.A. Torrey called The Practice and Work of the Holy Spirit. And what he, what he does is he actually takes every verse that the Spirit of God is mentioned, the Holy Spirit is mentioned, and he t- talks about the attributes, the character, the personality of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so it's a very thick book, but it's not necessarily a hard to understand book. It's just thick because the Holy Spirit's actually mentioned so much in it. So we need to honor who the Holy Spirit is. Jesus talks about you can sin against the Father, you can speak a word against the Son, but if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, it won't be forgiven in this age or the age to come. Now there's a lot of different theologians who will tell you what that might mean, but I'm not even going to get into that. But all I'm saying is if I want to honor Jesus, then I want to honor the same way he honors the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? He's like pointing to saying this is the Holy Spirit. He is held in high regard. He's not an an invisible energy force. He's a person. He has a personality. It's a legal prayer to say, Holy Spirit, Thank you for what you're doing. That's legal. Now, I'm not trying to confuse anybody. Every, look, the Trinity points to one another. Okay? They're not fighting for position. Okay? And so I'm not trying to confuse. What I'm trying to do is put the Holy Spirit back into place to where we need to honor him. So... Um, 
You guys heard me talk about three and one, that God is infinite and we are finite. For us to understand the totality of who God is is impossible. And that the Trinity is literally a mystery. It's the, it's the Christian position, the orthodoxical Christian position, that we understand the Trinity as a mystery. And we embrace that mystery because you can't understand the totality of who God is in, in all the aspects of the Trinity. What, what's so, un, what, what I love about the word mystery, there's different types of mystery. There's two types of mystery in the Bible. Um, one is, is something that won't be known until you're in heaven, but there's another one that's not that you'll never understand. It's just that it's inexhaustible. You'll never find the end of it. Doesn't mean you won't understand it. It doesn't mean that there's nothing to be revealed. It means that you will never get to the end of who God is. Listen, there's types of mystery. There's there's things that 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 we won't understand because it's just too hard to understand in our in our viewpoint, in our side of this world, you know, we see dimly through a, a glass, dimly lit, right? The Apostle Paul talks about that. Uh, we prophesy in part. We know in part. We don't know the wholeness of what we're, uh, uh, the, the full picture of certain aspects of who God is. But there's things that God does reveal to us. And he reveals them because it's, a, it's, 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 it's the purpose of kings to seek these things out. Like, like, I have 15-year-old children, and I have children that are under four, four and under. When I'm doing Easter egg hunts, I want my children to find them. And when I'm doing an Easter egg hunt for a four-year-old child, I put the Easter egg right here. I put another one right here put some below it. And it is my joy to find my children in discovery mode. Watching them, learning what it's like to discover. I think God looks at us like that. Now my 15 year old children, I might make it a little bit harder because they're growing. But I don't hide things from them. I hide things for them. You get it? Okay. Sometimes mystery is just so that you can journey with God through something together. So, um, the Holy Spirit, when we, when we talk about Jesus and, and, and from Sunday school, we learn that Jesus Christ uh, if, if we read the Bible, Jesus Christ, he is, um, where's, God, where's God the Father sit? This is not a trick question. In heaven, right? We know he's omnipresent, right? But let's just, he, he sits in heaven, right? Who's seated at his right side? Who ascended into heaven? Seated at his right? Jesus. Who's been poured out unto us? The Holy Spirit. So, so now we learn in Sunday school, who, who lives in our hearts? Jesus. How is that possible? Well, the Holy Spirit fulfills the message of Christ. So when we receive Christ, we have the Spirit of Christ. You guys get it? Okay? Um, so, so this is really important when we're, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit. We have to understand that He is, he is inside of us. He, he lives inside of us. We are, we are full of the Lord. We're full of Him. So let's, let's go to Acts 1.8. We'll pull, up, pull this up. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit to his disciples, and he's describing the Holy Spirit. He says this, you will receive power. Everyone say power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, power is not the Holy Spirit. It's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. When, when, uh, when people are getting touched by the Lord, I don't know if Randy went into this, but I'm just going to go through it a little bit. When people get touched by the Lord and they fall down, I can't tell whether it's the Lord or not. I hope it's the Lord. I think it's the Lord. I might have 10 people laying it all in a row, shaking and baking, rocking and rolling. And they say, 
you know, some people might say, hey, Paul, you know, you know, some of the things that happen in these meetings, you know, it's the devil, I think. I said, well, when when Jesus shows up, demons tremble. I mean, that should happen. And sometimes it's not God. I said, well, a lot of people, you know, there's there's people who are who are broken and, and, and they're still looking for healing in their emotions. And you know what? Yeah, some of it might be the flesh, of course. But a lot of it's God. But I don't judge it by the manifestation. See, Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit, not their roots. Did, you, did, did Randy talk about this at all? He did? No. Yes, no. No, no? Okay. All right, so, so when we see something happening, maybe somebody's trembling, maybe somebody's laughing, maybe somebody's rolling, maybe some, a bunch of people fell down, maybe some of this stuff is offensive. You're like, man, I'm really getting offended here. My religious spirit is like really... <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. So, but, you know, it's... I don't judge it by what, what they're manifesting. I see this. Do they love more when they get up? Do they have more patience? Are they evangelizing? Is there people getting touched through their life? Are they actually, is the Holy Spirit manifesting in their life? Then I go, man, what happened down there? Woo! That was the Lord. This power is not just power to heal the sick, although that's powerful. It's not just power to get a, a, a gifting from the Lord to propel his work on earth. This power is also power to be set free. I love uh, George Whitfield. I studied uh, uh, George Whitfield in, uh, in getting my Master's of Divinity, and, uh, and he has just an amazing story. He worked with, uh, he actually went to Oxford, uh, just a little bit younger than Charles and John Wesley. Charles and John Wesley were the um, uh, ones who started the Methodist movement out of the Anglican movement, um, and, and they were just revivalists. And George Whitfield is one of the only people who had a transatlantic revival. He had a, a revival in England. God was moving through his life in England, and he had a revival in the Americas when we were colonies. And uh, from Maine to Georgia, he would travel through the colonies, and, uh, and God was moving powerfully. Actually, I, I, I would read statements of George Whitfield's life and some of the fruit of his life, and he would, he would say this, uh, they, they would say this, that twenty to 30,000 people would be able to hear him at one time. Now, that's a supernatural happening. I mean, I, I speak on a microphone. I know what it's like. I know what And so I can't imagine George Whitfield actually speaking in twenty to 30,000 people. It's hard for me to believe that because I know what it's like to not speak with a microphone and how hard it is for people to hear. Now, sometimes they would put him in a bell tower. Sometimes they would put him under a tree that was over a valley and the tree like kind of curved up and it kind of had this amphitheater effect. Um, but, you know, they would have stories where he would take John Wesley as he was preaching to the coal miners and the coal miners would come out and he would be preaching to them and you would it, he talks about you would see the lines of the faces, the white lines as they were t crying in tears on these coal miner faces as they were giving their lives to Jesus. And so, George, uh, one of the reasons why I do believe the reports of George Whitfield is because I was reading Ben Franklin's diary writing about George Whitfield. Him and George Whitfield were friends. Did you know that? Ben Franklin never got saved, but wrote about how George really impressed him, how George and him, you know, disagreed on theology and God, but he couldn't deny the uh, example and the power of George Whitfield and his life. And he said when George went to Philadelphia, because that's where Ben Franklin lived, uh, Ben Franklin owned the papers there, he said that he would pace out while George is speaking. From the bell tower, he would pace out, and he reckons twenty to 30,000 people could hear him in one radius. It's powerful. George Whitfield talks about his own struggles. He, you could read his own personal diaries. George Whitfield talks about how he was in ministry school before, he, before this stuff happened. He was in ministry school. He loved the Lord. He was saved, but he had a problem in his life. He, he was, subset, he was uh, 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 struggling with a sin in his life, and it was, like, it was like no matter what he did, he could not get set free. I would call that a stronghold. 
It wasn't that he didn't love Jesus. It was like for 90 some percent of his life, he was fine. But there was this little bitty part that no matter what happened, he couldn't get set free until he starts fasting and praying and fasting and praying. And Jesus talks about this. He says this, knock and the door will be open to you. Seek and you will find. Ask and you'll receive. It's a wonderful verse. And it's really in reference to the Holy Spirit. He also talks about a, a, a man who comes to his neighbor in the middle of the night begging for bread. And he said, wouldn't you just give him bread so he would go away? How much more will my heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? But oftentimes that, that na- knock, that ask, that seek, we think it's only singular. But actually the way the verbs are, it should be actual a plural or, or a continuation If you were to translate it properly, according to the latest commentaries, it's this. It would be this, it would be said this way in the Aramaic. Knock and keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. Ask and keep on asking. And the door will be opened. And you will find. And you will receive. Too often we do this when it comes to the things of the Spirit. I guess he's not showing up today. When the reality, God expects us to do this. God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I can't, I can't not have you, God. I need more, God. God, I'm not, I'm not giving up until you give me that bread, God. God, I'm, I'm pressing in, God. God, I know you have more for me. I know there's breakthrough. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. And George Whitfield started knocking for freedom. Fasting and praying. And then he comes on holiday to take communion. During communion, he feels the presence of God come upon his body. And he no longer struggles with that sin anymore. He gets a freedom that only the Spirit could give. I know what it's like. I remember in my own life, When I got radically converted, I went all in for Jesus. But even in my own life, it was like I struggled in a certain area of my life and I couldn't get free. It wasn't that uh, I I love disciplines and I love, you know, uh, accountability and I love all the programs that we have. But it was like if I wasn't fighting every moment of every day, if I stopped, I failed. It was like it was demonically motivated temptation. And so I said, God, I know you have more for me. I know there's more than this for me. It wasn't that there wasn't temptation in my life. It was that I couldn't resist this temptation. It was too hard. So I started doing this. I started knocking. I started fasting and praying. I wasn't telling everybody. And in my bedroom, while I'm laying on my bed, I was still living with my parents at the time as an adult man. I don't know if you, if you heard my story before. I, I, uh, my wife had left me and I'd lost my children and I ended up being back in my parents' house. And I said, God, I know there's more. So I was peti- doing some t- petitionary prayer. I was just like, God, I just thank you for everything you've done in my life. I thank you for what you're doing. I'm asking that, you know, you provide for my family. Just standard types of prayer. All of a sudden, this... Energy comes on my body. I've never felt it before. Now listen, there's been times, I'm not a feeler type person. I'm not like sensitive in a lot of other ways that some of my friends are just, man, they're like little buckets. I mean, like you, they, they would walk in a room, they're like, woo, the Holy Spirit's all over this place. I'm like, where? Where's he at? Is there, is there a fan going on? What's going on? What's, what, are you, what are you feeling? You know, like I'm not that, that person. I'm not designed that way. I wasn't, it was never. You know, I would feel the Holy Ghost goosebumps. Have you ever felt them where you're just like, hmm, God's here. I love it. I'm going to raise my hand now. Thank you. All right. Um, so I, uh, but, I, but normally that, you know, I've never felt any of these other things that, that uh, others had experienced. And in the middle of my pressing in and my seeking and my knocking, in the middle of my room, there was no, keyboard playing with pads, you know, where 
You know what I'm talking about? Keyboardists. Okay. There's no smoke machine. There's no emotional help. I felt this surging coming through my body, up and down. And I started crying. And I was crying, and I was crying, and I was crying. Because I realized that God was touching me. And I started to do the Holy Ghost crunches that Randy talks about, where you're, you know, you're just constantly doing this, and, and, and it hurts. You know, I don't have abs. They're down. They're, they're in there somewhere. And, it, you know, I was sore the next day. For 30, 30 45 minutes, I'm doing the Holy Ghost crunches, and, and, and I'm laughing. And, 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 I, and I told, <laughs> and I, listen, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and people cried when God moved. That was a normal response. When I heard uh, people were laughing, I thought, that can't be God. God can make you cry. He can't make you laugh. I don't know why. It just made sense. <laughs> I'm going to go on a rep trail real quick. My brother, he went out to, um, he's older than me. He's about seven years older than me. And he, he uh, got married and, um, and went out to California. And, um, and uh, he was telling me, I was telling him how, you know, God can't make people laugh. And he said, you know, Paul, um, Karen laughed once. I said, what, Karen? Now, Karen is his wife, and she is the sweetest little person I've ever met. She's just so sweet. She, you know, like, she's a super introvert. Like, if you talk to her, that's the only way she'll talk to you. She doesn't, like, talk to you without you first talking to her. She's an introvert. How many of you are introverts? How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You're not really introverts because she wouldn't have even raised her hand. It was a test. <laughs> an introvert really wouldn't have raised her hand. And I caught you all. Frauds. No, just kidding. So, so she wouldn't. She, this is the type of person she is. And I, I said, Karen laughed. He said, Karen laughed. I said, you got to tell me that story. And he said, that, he said we were at a church in uh in in uh california and we're listening to this uh visiting minister and he's did a wonderful wonderful uh uh sermon and we he had an altar call and we came forward we you know we grew up in a pentecostal church we knew how to assume the position you know he's down the line and he's you know he's going phil 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 never found phil but <laughs> phil no okay Phil? All right. So that's just a little joke. It's not true. It's just, sorry, just keeping the mood light. And uh, my, my brother said he got to Karen and she fell down, which is not odd, uh, just not normal for Karen. So he's like, wife's getting touched. Yes, God, thank you, God, touching my wife. Thank you. You know, he didn't fall down and the guy kept going. And then she started crying. He's like, whoa, tears. God's moving powerfully. It's awesome. Thank you, God. Wailing. And then she started to laugh. And she was laughing and laughing and laughing. And my brother's like, huh? <laughs> she wouldn't stop. She stayed there for the longest time. My brother starts to apologize for her. He's very embarrassed for her. He's like, I'm sorry. It's not my wife. She, the guy touched her and she fell. And I don't know what's happening. And, and you know, so I, you know, this isn't normal, you know, kind of thing. And, and, uh, and then, and, you know, she was the last one to get up. And, you know, the sound man, you know, flicks the lights. And uh, he's like, oh, man, I got to get her out. Okay. Um, so he's, he said he had to carry her, like, like help her on her own. And she was walking and she couldn't, like, stand under her own power, almost like she was uh, inebriated, you know, except not by wine. And, uh, and, and, and he said that she was laughing and he puts her in the car and she's laughing and he puts her to bed and she's laughing. And the next morning he's eating breakfast. He's eating cereal at the kitchen table and she comes in and she's like, wow, last night was crazy. And he's like, yeah, what happened? <laughs> and she's like, well, you know, when the minister was looking for Phil, he said, yeah, he touched me. And I fell down, and I felt the, felt the presence of the Lord, and I just fell. And he goes, yeah, I saw that. And she goes, it was great. 
And then Jesus came in this vision. And he showed me a moment where I was significantly hurt. And I'm not going to explain the story to keep her details private, but a significant hurt in her life. And it was like he ripped it out and healed it. And this flood of tears just came. And she said, Anthony, I cried and cried and cried. But when I was done, it was like a flood of joy so filled me that I couldn't help but laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. And when I heard that story, I thought, okay, God, you can make people laugh. We don't know what God's doing in people. You don't know. So uh, there I am, back to my story. I'm on my bed, and this electricity is flowing through me. Holy Ghost crunches. I'm crying. I'm laughing. I'm experiencing all the things I used to wander about. And then, and then, uh, and then I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking my mom's going to kick down the door because Italian mothers are a bit aggressive. If something's off, they're going to be like, you know, what's going on here? But uh, she didn't. She, she must not hurt me. But I was, I was just so enjoying the presence of God in my room, and I didn't know what God was doing. I didn't know in the moment what God was doing. But I just said, God, if this is you, just do what you need to do. But after that experience was the first time in my life I never struggled in that area again. It's not that I was never tempted, but I had the power to overcome that temptation. I had the power to say no. This power is also power to set you free. It's power to give you what you need. Jesus says that he will send the helper, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. The literal translation of paraclete is the one who comes alongside to give you what you need. I don't know if Randy talked about this. We overlap because I'm his spiritual son and we used to not speak in the same conference and now I am. So, but, but it means he gives you comfort for those who need comfort. He gives you help for those who need help. He gives you equipping for those who need equipping, power for those who need empowerment. Whatever you're going through, the Holy Spirit's here to give you what you need. And when he's speaking of the term another, it's a literal term. It doesn't mean like another, like um, this is one box and he's going to send another box. These are two different boxes. What another means is that this is one box and he's sending another another box of the exact same thing. But now instead of it being on one person, the whole church gets filled. Do you understand? All right. I keep going to go to my notes, but I'm doing this all from memory. So Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing in this room. God, I just pray that you would say what you need to say. That you would say what you want to say. So we were, um, so I I talked about when um, I came to my ministry school and it was like like I joined the charismatic zoo, right? And uh, everyone's shaking and rolling and, and, uh, and, and, you know, I thought, you know, and I was judging everything. And God said, you don't know their hearts. You don't know what I brought them through. Stop worrying about how they worship. Start worrying about how you worship. So we just need to be careful of how we judge what God's doing. And we need to know that it is unto something. That there needs to be fruit. And that we judge the fruit, not the root. Um. I want to share a story about when we, um, when my wife and I first got married, my twins were about seven years old, and um, maybe eight years old, actually, and uh, we ended up, um, they were nine years old, okay, they were nine years old, and we didn't have much money, I was a uh, poor student, I, uh, I, I sold everything I had to go to ministry school. I lived off of a budget. My wife really gave up a lot to marry me. Um, she had a career. She made good money. 
and she sold it all, and she came to America where she was not allowed to work because she came as a legal uh, on a visa. Uh, we, we, went, we waited a year and a half for that process, but when she got here, she couldn't work, so we had no money. And when you're a bachelor, men can live like cavemen. I mean, I didn't, everything I had in my little apartment uh, was just uh, handed to me, and it was a dirty apart. I mean, it was like, it was in a condo apartment building kind of thing, and so you'd go in and you'd smell like cat, smoke, curry, you know, garlic, all types of different, you know, because everyone's close. All their apartments are close. Their doors are thin. And then you get into our apartment and, you know, we made it a home. But it was just very, you know, she gave up a lot. You know, I had a, I had a, uh, a couch that had a broken leg. And so I just took a dumbbell and put it right under there. And it was just perfect, you know. <laughs> it's just that's the kind of life we live. Um, and then uh, I remember, actually, I remember going through this thing where we, um, she said, you know, Honey, can we get a coffee table? There's, we, I didn't own a coffee table. And she's like, you know, I just have nothing to place my tea on and, uh, and coffee on. And I said, sure, why don't you just take some pictures of, like, you know, different things, and we'll, we'll save up money, and, and we'll buy it, you know. And, and so, she, so when I got back from a trip, I said, hey, did you check out some things? She goes, yeah. She showed me this. She's like, uh, she showed me this first thing. I said, what is that? She goes, and, and what it was was wooden pallets that were, like, stapled together, like old wooden pallets. Uh, and she goes, it's uh, reclaimed wood. I said, why is it $800? You know, like, why would you? It's like a, a rip. <laughs> you know. Anyway, there was another one. And she shows the next one. It's like this wooden spool, you know, like in a shipyard, like an empty wooden spool with like a, a mirror glued on top. I was like, what's that? She's like, it's repurposed furniture. I said, why is it $1,500? Like, why, why does it have to be that? So anyway, um, I said, if, if, if you don't care what it looks like, I'll just build it. And that's what I did. I took wood, and I, I sawed it and, and built it, and it looked like someone put, you know, old furniture together. And it was $60. Anyway. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, back to my story. So, what was I going to talk about? <laughs> oh, so we didn't have much money, and we couldn't afford Christmas gifts for, for uh, the whole family. And... Um, so we decided, why don't we just do a family gift? And so we, uh, I'm from the city, born in Philly, um, uh, never camped a day in my life. But we thought, oh, why don't we just like buy camping, like a camping gift for everyone? And so we bought like a tent and some sleeping bags and a little Coleman gas propane grill thing. It's like one of those travel things. And, um, and on Christmas time, we just opened it all together. And we even like set it all up inside the house and uh, the little apartment, which the, the, tent, the tent couldn't even extend all the way. And so um, uh, it was just this fun th idea. And then uh, when it came time in June, we decided to rent the, uh, the state park. Uh, you can rent for like $10 a day. So, again, we're on a budget, so we did that, and we're driving into the camp, um, and, man, I realized how uneducated we were about what you need for camping. <laughs> and um, we're, I had this old Volkswagen uh, station wagon that I was driving, and I'm coming in, and these people are professional campers. There's, like, RVs and... You know, everyone's like been there for weeks, all decked out like the, and, and, and they're just looking at us driving in, you know, mm -hmm. and so uh, I, I drive, it's like a little, gra you know, the $10, for 10 bucks, it's like a gravel spot you put your car on, and then in front of your car is a spot where you can set up your tent, and so my wife and my daughter started doing that, and then uh, my son and I, <clears throat> we noticed that there's this like metal ring in, uh, in front of our spot, and we, we saw, oh, this is a, a fire pit place. Like, you can start your own fire here. I didn't even think about, like, having a fire. I just thought about the grilling. I thought, oh, we, we can cook our food on the grill. And so I said, son, let's, uh, let's be men. Let's, uh, let's start a fire. How hard is it to start a fire? So, uh, so I get... Um, I get these, <laughs> I, I, I go to the corner convenience store, I get some matches, and it's like, you know, it's like the, the people in the country can smell when city folk are around. They're like coming out of their RVs, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, they're watching us set up, and we were literally the only one with a tent. Um, and, and people are um, 
watching us, and, and, and we're just collecting wood around the campsite, and, uh, and this guy uh, next to us, he's, he's uh, running run at the spot next to us, he's just holding his beer, watching us. And I'm like, hey, what's up, man? Just me and my son starting to fire. So, uh, so anyway, we, we get the fire there, and, and my son wants to light it. I said, no, son, you can't light it. I got to light it. And so, so I get the match, and I'm like, Hold on. Block the wind, son. Block the wind. And the, the guy holding the, the beer can is like, you're not going to be able to start a fire like that. I said, why not? It's fire and wood. He said, the wood's too wet. I said, it's not wet. He said, no, it's rained a few days ago. It's not dried out enough. You won't we'll never be able to start that wood. He said, you need dry wood. I said, oh, okay. Well, I, I didn't have dry wood. I actually went to that same store, bought a bag of dry wood, because that's the solution for every city guy. Just let's buy it. And so, um, so anyway, I got my dry wood, and I put it there. And now, I don't know why this guy slow played me, all right, okay, except for his own entertainment. But... So I'm there with my son. I'm like, all right, son, we got this dry wood. And I light it, and the flame goes up the side of the big wood, and it goes out. Do it again, it goes out. And the guy's looking at me. He's like, you're not going to be able to start a fire like that. I said, why not? I said, it's dry wood. I got the dry wood. He goes, it's too big. You need kindling. I said, what's kindling? He said, it's, it's usually like twigs and leaves and stuff. He said, but around here... Uh, it's too wet. He says, do you have toilet paper? I said, oh, we got a lot of toilet paper. See, for some reason, if, if you're from the city and you got to go camping, you have this weird fear you're going to run out of toilet paper. I don't know why. We brought like six to eight rolls, a whole case of toilet paper. I was like, what did we think was going to happen in the next three days that we would need this? Like looking back, I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking. I was in, inexperienced. So uh, I was like, oh, we got toilet paper, you know, because it's like paper, cardboard. So we got toilet paper. So we got the paper and we put it in there and, and we lit it and it went, Pfft. I said, see, babe, we should have bought that two ply. This single ply will never work. No, just kidding. That was a joke. I never said that. So we put the toilet paper in there and the guy said, now, when you light it, breathe on it and it'll intensify and heat up and so we lit it and we breathed on it and we catered to that fire until finally that larger wood lit and we were so proud and we were like that fire must never go out and we just kept saying it's like because it's so hard to light a fire sometimes if you don't know what you're doing and well I love that story because so often I find myself in one of those stages. Sometimes I'm too comfortable in where I'm at. I'm like that wet wood. God sends his fire. But I'm too, I'm not desperate enough for him. I'm not hungry enough for him. Sometimes I'm like the big dry logs. I want God to light the big vision. Yet I won't. Be willing to steward the kindling of the small fire he lit. I think one of us, as some of us are at different stages. You know, I do feel that, and I do believe strongly that we are believers. And so it's not by what we feel that we attain these things. Some people say, I want to feel this, I want to feel that. I say, that's not what it's about. But we are in communion with him and made in his image. And so, of course, he's made us to feel things. God feels compassion. God feels joy. God feels peace. He knows what power is. So if you feel those things, don't stop that from happening. Just be a sail in the wind. If he's breathing, go. But sometimes I just challenge myself and my friends. You know, I, when I went to, um, when I would go to the beach, it, it just amazed me how, I think, this is what I think, I think some of us are just deeper buckets than others. 
And the water line needs to get higher for you to get filled. You need to press in further. You need to go and, and knock more and seek more and ask more. Like if, if I walk my, I mean, if I put my four-month-old baby on the shoreline, one wave will take her out. If I take my two-year-old son, we could walk maybe three or four steps before a wave would take him out. My three-year-old, maybe another step or two. My four-year-old, five more steps and she's gone. Me, I could walk maybe another six steps and then I'm gone. My Norwegian friends, maybe another ten steps and they're gone. My point is, we're all different and we're not made the same. But some of us give up just off of one knock and then have to build a theology of why God didn't come in that way. You know, the disciples, when they were asking for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, they, they, they waited 10 days. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, pray that the Spirit comes, right? And so they're in Jerusalem waiting. How long would we have waited? I wonder, God, how long would I have waited? I mean, I've been in prayer meetings. Have you been in prayer meetings? And you're like, okay, it's been four hours. Did we do it? This is, you know, maybe a day. Would I have, would I have lasted a day? Would I have lasted two days with them? They're, I know if they did other things. I know they, you know, found, you know, decided on a disciple and they must have corporately been communing, communing together and fellowshipping, but they were together waiting for the Spirit to come. They were not, they were, they, 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 they purposed in their hearts not to leave. And so, would they have waited, would I have waited three days? Would, maybe I would have said, like, hey guys, you know, Jesus rose in three days. It's not happened yet. Maybe we missed it. Maybe it looks like something else. Maybe it's something else. Maybe we just, maybe we heard him wrong. Maybe we didn't, maybe we're thinking of something else. Would I start to try to create a theology within the group of why uh, the Holy Spirit is here. And you know what I'm saying? I'm just, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud with you. I'm not trying to create a theology. I'm just saying, how long would we have survived? See, we live in a different culture right now where we're used to getting things instantly. I mean, I, I grew up, and I know most of us have, where, you know, I remember 56K. What do you know that? That's dial-up internet. I would log into my email, go get a cup of coffee, come back and go, oh, what's this email? Click on that email, go and make my bed, come back, and then the email loaded. And we thought that was quick, right? What I'm saying is, back now go 2,000 years back, Okay? And I'm not saying we need to wait 10 days and have 10-day rallies and all this stuff. But what I'm saying is, Pentecost is on the 50th day. That means there was 10 days of waiting. And I know we have church, we have a church structure for a reason. I'm not saying we should have endless services. I think we need to have services with times. I would go nuts because I like to know what time things start and end. But when it comes to being filled and being empowered, being set free, being commissioned, receiving a grace of his, or, being, or receiving empowerment from him, or asking for more from him, I don't like to put him on a timeline. I'm going to do it till he answers, because that's what he told me to do. Look, I'm going to do a play on words here. I know it looks like I can bench 200 pounds. Three? Yeah. Looks, looks can be deceiving. I've been fat molding for three pounds. Oh, three pounds. Um, but I can't. However, if I went to the gym, maybe every day or every other day, and took a lot of supplements... Maybe, hopefully, I would be able to 
bench press 200 pounds. Listen, when we weight train with him, when we're waiting on him, there's a strength that's happening within us that you can't get without waiting. When it says those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, they're not talking about being restful. They're talking about you getting stronger because there's an intimacy that's building. A 10-day wait, a 10-day wait. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes. So much so, so, so much so, That there's tongues of fire. The wind is blowing. Peter gets up and has to explain. As people are speaking in different languages, he has to say, these people are not drunk as you suppose. Which is so interesting and so and speaks into the moment so much because I've been around a lot of drunk people before. Have you? I've never been around a drunk person who stood up and talked in a different language and me go, that person's drunk. Of course they were talking in different languages. It says they were, that the people heard their own language. But they still thought they were drunk. Peter says it's only midday. They haven't had any wine yet. They were obviously behaving in a manner where they either couldn't, I don't know how do drunk people behave, couldn't stand under their own weight. Maybe they were Giggly, joyful, shaking, falling over. It infers that they were behaving in a manner that people would think they were drunk. And so when the Spirit of God comes upon us, sometimes it can be in like that. Where it looks like, whoa, what's going on with this person? Get yourself together. But in these moments, I want you to give God Use your self-control to give God full control in those moments and allow him to do what he wants. I remember when I was in uh, Taiwan and um, I was Randy's assistant and I was just running around and, uh, and uh, helping him and, and I was sitting on the front row with Randy uh, just like you two are and, and uh, Bill Johnson was on the stage. It was a 5,000 person meeting it was in a stadium and uh and and bill doesn't want to pray for five thousand people because it's impossible for him to pray for that many so what he does is he has people lay hands on each other and he prays what he would pray for them and i forget what he told them to pray something significant and and i saw randy and i was like i'm not going to pray for randy i'm going to have him pray for me you know like <laughs> and he prays for me and i fall drop like a sack of potatoes Two of three times where God moved like that in my life. And I'm shaking under the power of God. Everyone loved me so much they just left me there. <laughs> it was lunch or dinner time, I forget which. And, and, uh, and the, I remember finally after some time, I don't know, an hour or so, I opened my eyes and the janitor's just looking at me, you know, <laughs> sweeping up, you know, because he doesn't know what's going on. And, uh, and I dust myself off. And, but in that moment, what Randy didn't know is that for weeks, I was pressing in to see more. I was praying for people in pain, and I saw some progress. But I didn't see cancer disappear yet. I didn't see the blind see yet. I didn't see tumors disappear yet. And so I was going, God, I know there's more. I know there's more. I can't keep praying for the sick and not seeing significant breakthrough. I need more of you, God. If this is what you want me to do, I'll say yes and I'll keep going, but I need more. After that experience, weeks later I have that experience. After that experience, I saw the blind see. I saw a crooked back go straight. I saw a tumor disappear under my hand. It was an impartation. 
It was an empowerment by the Spirit. Thank you.